1943 saw a lot of war across the whole world, with decisive battles and the attritional grind of modern warfare. Like all wars, this one is waged by humans in order to kill other humans. But sometimes, to understand this, you need to focus on the numbers. And in this video, that is exactly what we're doing, because whether they detail planes or trains, numbers tell us what kind of war this is becoming. I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Spartacus Olson. And this is a World War II special episode looking at some of the numbers of 1943. At the end of last year, we started to see the war shift into a numbers game. The Axis powers hadn't been able to win a swift victory with a qualitative edge and had begun staring down the quantitative might of the Allies. And this year, that has really swung into action. But wait, before I get started, I'll say that a lot of the big numbers I'm using here come from either Mark Harrison or Phillips O'Brien. Both scholars are very thorough, but different rounding of figures and even different ways of calculating them sometimes means they are slightly different across different sources. Anyway, between the belligerents on both sides, there are roughly 43 million bodies in uniform right now. Two thirds of them are fighting on the Allied side who hold an advantage of about two to one on all fronts. Still, the real kicker for the Axis is the Allies' advantage in stuff like weapons. This year, the big three, that's the Americans, the British, and the Soviets, have produced 10,029,000 rifles, while Japan and Germany have produced 2,909,000. The big three have produced 105,200 combat aircraft, while Japan and Germany have produced 32,000. If you zoom out, to look at the war in its entirety, the Allies will outproduce the Axis in all major categories of ground and air munitions by a margin of 5 to 2. And this advantage is sharpened by the Allies pooling their resources. To make aircraft, you need aluminum. And this is something the Soviets actually struggled to procure. Luckily for them, the Americans have a lot of it, and they've been shipping it over in Lend-Lease. In fact, this year, the USSR received more ingot aluminum from the US than the US Navy did. The Soviets got 145 million pounds of it. The Navy got 121 million pounds. These advantages are down to basic economic facts, like industrial development, geographic size, access to natural resources, and population. Here, America is the powerhouse. Let's, let's zoom right down on one production facility, right? Well, okay, I say zoom down, but the Ford Motor Company's Willow Run bomber plant is pretty darn big. Sitting safely in Michigan, far from any threat of being bombed, the Americans have constructed a main building that covers 67 acres. That's like 50 football fields, which houses mile-long production lines. The entire Willow Plant complex covers around three square miles. A lot of that is made up by the adjoining airport, but there's also a power plant, a sewage treatment facility, and a medical center. And just, here's some numbers. Just in April 1943, this medical center treated around 19,000 lacerations, 450 burns, 1,600 puncture wounds, and had to send three workers to outside hospitals. At its production peak, Willow Plant employs 30,000 men and women who get through 8,800 rolls of toilet paper per month, and they are spitting out a lot of B-24 heavy bombers. It has actually taken a while for Willow Plant to start hitting its targets, though. This is partly because the B-24 itself is going through so many design changes, 130 major ones in all. But they are now firmly on the right path. By early next year, workers will follow through on Ford's promise that bombers can be mass-produced and start completing one B-24 in one hour. The plant will manufacture a total of 8,685 B-24s. That is impressive, but American President Franklin Roosevelt is going into the new year pretty disappointed with the level of aircraft production so far. It's easy to think that the economic potential of the U.S. 
is so great that it can just produce whatever it wants. But even in America, resources are finite and different groups wrestle over their allocation. In 1942, Roosevelt set some pretty high targets for war production. He directed that while aircraft should be the first priority, this shouldn't compromise any commitments to other categories. But this proved a pretty difficult principle to stick to. Turns out Roosevelt was a bit too optimistic about American capacity and resources, and all production targets were set to be off by at least 20%, and in some cases much more. He ordered the production of 107,000 planes by the end of this year, 1943. 82,000 were to be combat aircraft. This strict target meant the Army had to make a range of cutbacks though, like original plans for US Army strength envisioned it to have 200 divisions. Roosevelt's priorities have influenced projections being cut down to about 100. And as I said, Roosevelt is still disappointed. The factories have not achieved their targets. By the end of this year, only around 85,000 planes have been produced, about 54,000 of these being combat aircraft. Roosevelt is not the only leader to prioritize aircraft, which is why I'm talking about it so much. In fact, air power is a clear favorite not only in the US, but also Japan, Britain, and Germany. Aircraft production alone accounts for at least a third of the total war production in the US, Germany, and Japan. In Britain, it is almost half. As for the Soviets, they do produce a massive amount of aircraft, about 28% of the big three total of combat aircraft in 1943. But relatively speaking, they don't prioritize it the same way as the other powers. On a front as massive as the Eastern Front, Soviet air doctrine focuses mainly on close air support. Plus, the Red Army packs a lot of highly effective artillery firepower anyway, so it is not dependent on aerial supremacy. Nevertheless, Soviet planes will still soon start overwhelming German ones next year. If you want to see how that's already beginning now, then check out the recent video I did on the state of the Luftwaffe in late 1943. Anyway, air power is clearly considered by most major powers to be the deciding factor in this war, and they've thrown an awful lot of resources at it. Here is one more example of many resources the air war consumes. In the second half of this year, Germany devoted 130,000 tons of concrete per month to building protected aircraft factories inside the country. By contrast, it has allocated 100,000 tons per month for defenses in Belgium and France and 90,000 tons for fortifications in the East. But hey, getting onto the topic of the war over Germany is a good time to hand this episode over to Spartacus. Really, he's good at this stuff. So take it away, Sparty. Okay. A load of these aircrafts have been bombing Germany and its occupied areas. In total, 206,188 tons of bombs have been dropped on Axis Europe by United Nations Allied Air Forces this year. 131,668 of this has been in area raids. If you have watched my episodes covering the bombing of Hamburg, it won't surprise you to learn that the heaviest months for this type of raid was July, August, and September, when 43,211 tons were dropped. Relative to other military campaigns, this tonnage isn't especially remarkable. The preliminary barrage for the American landings on Tarawa in November involved over 3,000 tons of shells. Both sides consider the air war over Germany to be a vital theater, and figures like the tonnage dropped reflect that. What does make this figure remarkable is that hundreds of thousands of tons of bombs haven't been dropped on enemy forces and their fortifications, but on houses and streets. And so, 6% of Germany's residential housing has been destroyed or heavily damaged this year. That percentage is much higher in urban areas, of course. As raids on Hamburg in the summer resulted in the total destruction of at least 31% of all its housing stock. Now, you have to put that into perspective of the area the United Nations are trying to bomb. The German Reich now covers 823,505 square kilometers, that's 370,957 square miles. More than 100 cities have over 100,000 inhabitants, and they are all of economic significance. The United Nations simply can't bomb all of them all the time. Even if they bomb a couple of cities each day, by the time they've bombed the others and come back, 
much of the destruction on the economy has been fixed or compensated by moving it elsewhere. For example, despite the massive destruction of Hamburg in July, the city is back at 80% of its former productivity as we enter 1944. That explains why German industrial output has continued to rise throughout 1943, although at a slower rate of increase than the year before. The increase in bombing and, despite it, industrial output reflects most aspects of this war. But here is one aspect which has been a slowdown this year. Last year, 1,982,000 souls were gassed in German extermination factories. This year, it has only been 350,000. Still a horrific number, but one which reveals how the SS have now largely completed their self-assigned task to wipe out Polish Jewry. The success of Operation Reinhardt means that there are simply less Jews to murder, and Sobibor, Treblinka, and Bevcec have all wrapped up. It also reflects the shift of focus towards death by enslavement. As 1943 ends, the number of slaves held in concentration camps, slave factories, and work camps has surpassed 10 million people. Close to 2 million are POW, close to 4 million foreign forced or coerced laborers, and another 4 million concentration camp inmates. They now make up 25% of Germany's labor force. Huge amounts of people that have to be moved either to their death or to enslavement. Under my videos, I often see comments about the drain this poses on German logistics, the effort it takes away from the actual war effort. Not only does that miss the point that for the Nazis, extermination and subjugation is the actual war. It's their primary war goal. Furthermore, as is the case with large numbers, they tend to get abstract and the big picture is hard to grasp. Let's look at the deportation of Jews as an example. In 1942, there were a total of 734 deportations. This year, there have been 298. 147 of them went to Poland, 23 to Sobibor, 10 to Treblinka, 1 to Wierzbica, Lublin, and 113 to Auschwitz. For destinations outside of Poland, 137 went to Theresienstadt, 4 to Berlin, 3 to Thessaloniki, 2 to Bergen-Belsen, 2 to Westerbork, 1 to Ravensbrück, 1 to Dubnitza, and 1 to Buchenwald. Terrible numbers when you consider what is happening, but numbers that are dwarfed by the overall carrying capacity of the service running most of the deportation, the Deutsche Reichsbahn. In 1943, it is able to transport 3,540,000,000 passengers annually with 1,034,000 cars. That's 9.7 million per day, or over 400,000 per hour. So the 298 deportations are barely a blip on the radar of such a massive enterprise. Not only that, the Nazis use cattle cars, so it has little to no effect on the overall passenger carrying capacity. It also pales in comparison to the number of trains dedicated to military campaigns. In the month leading up to Operation Barbarossa in 1941, around 2,500 trains per working day were being sent to staging areas. So overall, and contrary to what I said at the beginning of this video, Technical numbers don't help us very well to understand the war against humanity. If anything, they show us the relatively low effort it takes to exact terror. The number of aircraft assigned for the air war over Germany and the amount of tonnage they drop is a diversion of force from the regular war, but one that is by now well within the resources of the Western Allies' aeronautical production capacity. They may very well exact devastating destruction and death, but when you put it into the scope of the size of the world and the size of the German nation, it's not so astonishing that it doesn't reach its goals. Deporting Jews all the way across Europe only for them to be gassed reveals the grim genocidal intent of the Nazi regime. But it is still not only a tiny fraction of its logistical capacity, it also puts close to no drain on the working or fighting force of the German nation. When Jews arrive at the camps, their imprisonment and often murder is overseen by around 20 to 30 Germans and up to 140 foreign auxiliaries. Even with hundreds of camps in operation, that number of people is dwarfed by the millions of Germans and foreign slaves producing and fighting. No. What makes all of this astounding is the effect it all has in human loss. And even that human loss is difficult to quantify because not many people are keeping track. 
The cold efficiency of the Holocaust means we have a clear enough picture on the scale and pace of destruction. But that is not the case everywhere. The Germans underestimate their losses in bombing raids because the officials meant to be doing the counting have often died themselves. Bodies lay anonymously all over the world, killed by the violence of war, starvation, disease, or arbitrary murder, and are often carted off to be mass buried. Going into 2023, historians will still debate the number of deaths and the pace of them for the whole war. Still, there is something most people will agree on as this year comes to a close. We think we know which way the wind is blowing, but we also definitely know that the end of all this killing is still a long way off. We will be there to cover this in its entirety. 1944 is soon upon us. The Allies think they have a war-winning strategy, but even if they do, how long will the Axis hold on? And how many lives will be lost before it is all over? Keep watching in the new year to find out. Indy has looked at the numbers of World War II before. Go check out his 1942 video last year to see how they looked as we entered 1943. It's right here. And that special, and this special, and all the specials, and all of our regular content is produced thanks to the Time Ghost Army. And you can be a part of this by joining the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Ooh.